Okay, so I think we are live. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for joining me today. Are we loud enough? I hope so. Hope the volume is okay. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me today, and uh, we are going to do the study in uh, Songs of Songs, continuing in the Songs of Songs. I know it's been a while ever since we, we did the Song of Songs study, but today on an awkward day, it's not a Sabbath, it's not a Sunday, it's a Friday that I have decided I think we need to do this study because it's been a long time coming, and I think it's the right time. I hope my... Whoever is watching, I've seen, I think, about two people are watching. Please give me feedback on the sound. I'm still trying to figure out how to fix the sound. And yeah, I have this, but we're not going to use it today because I still, I'm still learning on how to connect this stuff. So uh, yeah, when it comes to sound thing and all that, I'm still learning. So, But either way, technology is not going to get in our way of preaching the gospel. So what we're going to do today is pick it up from where we left it in the Songs of Songs. So if the sound is okay and you're able to hear me proper, just give me yeah, maybe a thumbs up as a comment or something down there just to hear if the sound is okay. So today we'll pick it up. Uh, last time we did the Songs of Songs, I think that was about two or two, three months ago. We, we stopped in uh, Songs of Songs, chapter 6, verse 6. That's what we looked at. So today we're going to pick it up in verse 7 of the Songs of Songs study. And it's under the title, the pomegranates, the pomegranate, the seeds which are packed in blood. So it's a picture of seeds that are packed in blood. And that's going to be the thought that will be running through the study as we go through it today. Seeds that are packed in blood or the seed packed in blood. So I'll pick it up from Songs of Songs. We'll read the first two verses that are going to be the center focus. Of course, one is in Songs of Songs, chapter 6, verse 7. Then we'll go to Songs of Songs, chapter 4, verse 3. All these verses are intimating or meeting and facing each other, giving us the idea of this bride. Remember, this is, um, this is Solomon exalting the Shulamite. This is Jesus talking about his bride. There is a certain posture that is attractive to Jesus of his bride. And here we find it in Songs of Songs, chapter 6, verse 7, is exalting a certain element, a certain posture about her, which is the same posture that we need to have as God's people, especially in the end time, because the Songs of Songs is couched in the most holy place where Jesus Christ is ministering to us and doing his final work. So we need to look at what is our position, what is our posture, our disposition, our demeanor as God's people. What kind of posture do we need to have? So when we do the, pomanga, the pomegranate study today, you're going to see the posture of the heart of God's people compared to the other posture, which is of the other woman. So I'll read to you Songs of Songs, chapter 6, verse 7. It says, As a piece of pomegranate are thy cheeks or thy temples within thy locks. The cheeks, which are the temples, within the locks, within the hair, are like piece of a pomegranate. So this is the description that he gives to his bride. And it's very important that we study the pomegranate and understand what it means and what it stands for, right? So in Songs of Songs, chapter 4, verse 3, we find this verse again, collaborating it with the verse that we just read. It says, Thy lips, your lips, are like a thread of scarlet, and your speech is calmly. Your temples or your cheeks are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. Again, that is the same phrase that we just read in Songs of Songs, chapter, chapter 6 and 7, where he says, your cheeks or your temples are like a piece of pomegranate within your locks. So he's talking about the cheeks which are within the hair which is covering her, the hair which is laid down. So it's a picture of a woman with reddish or should we say blushing. We know that blushing is actually a word and it's a word that means it's an involuntary reading 
of the face due to embarrassment, stress, or shame. When a person is blushing, they have this readiness on their face. It's as a result of shame, embarrassment, or stress, right? So the cheeks are within thy locks, the locks which are the hair, which are laid down. They are laid down. So it's a picture. This is this picture is very important because it tells us of the posture of the bride of Christ as he is exalting her in this verse. What is her posture? She is blushing. She has this red, it's a picture of the pom pomegranate. It's of the fruit pomegranate. It's reddish on the outside, and then inside it's got these seeds that are red. It's like seeds that are packed in blood. And that's where the title is coming from. So this picture is important because it tells us of the posture, the demeanor or the position or the posture of the bride of Christ as he's exalting her. So the posture, posture itself is everything because amongst the sin that God hates, Posture is mentioned. If you go back, we're going to read Proverbs chapter 6. You'll find that there is a certain posture that God says he hates amongst the seven sins that he mentions. Let's read Proverbs. Because posture is everything. Because this woman is in a disposition where she's got these red cheeks, which are like pomegranates, but she, her hair is also laid down. It's a position where she is anchoring down and not facing up. Her hair is not tied up, but it's actually down and covering the cheeks. And as he's seeing her, he says, your cheeks are like pomegranates. The pomegranates, the fruit pomegranate, which is reddish and has got seeds in it. So let's, let's look at this posture because posture is everything because among us, the sins that God hurts, posture is mentioned. The disposition that I'm going to have, if I'm going to have the high, heady, prideful posture, that says something about who and the disposition of my heart towards God. So in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, the Bible will read Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. It says, six things doeth God, doeth the Lord hate. So there are six things that he hates, and yea, seven are an abomination unto him. When we talk about the abomination that causes desolate, these are some of the things that are uh, involved in it. Listen to what it says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 17. It says, six things he hates, but verse 17, he says, a proud look. This woman who is the bride of Christ does not have a proud look on her face. So among us, the things that God hates, there's the posture of a proud look. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that are uh, that shed innocent blood. And then it says, listen to what Psalm says in Psalm chapter 10, verse 4, it says, The wicked, the wicked, through the pride of their countenance, we, we will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. So the pride of the countenance, a proud look, itself removes God from the thoughts that we have as human beings because a proud look is a posture that is contrary to the posture that this woman, the Shulamite woman, the bride of Christ is having. She has this posture where her hair is laid down and she is embarrassed. There's this shame around her. So is posture important? That's the question that we're posing. Is posture important? A posture that I have as a human being is an entrance. It's a window into my heart and the posture that I have inside me. Remember, we just read in the book of Psalms, chapter 20, verse 4, it says, The wicked through the pride of his countenance, his face, will not seek after God. And God is not in all his thoughts. Why? Because it's all about how I look, who I am. There's this image management that we have as human beings because we do not want to be ashamed. But that's a very different picture from the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is actually has got what is called shame facedness. And we'll look at that as we go through the study. So the posture itself is important because it's a way of the posture that shows us the posture, my disposition of my heart before God. So let's go to the book of Ezra.
In Ezra chapter 9, Ezra chapter 9, we read Ezra chapter 9, then we'll go to the book of Job chapter 40. Let's see these encounters of the posture that is actually acceptable before God, right? Look at what Ezra says in Ezra chapter 9, verse, uh, so in verse 6, it says, And saith, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush, the pomegranate picture, the reddish first. It says, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee. And my God, for my iniquities increase over my head, and my, in, and my transgression is grown up into the heavens. So this is a picture of a posture that is accepted before God. Remember in the, in the parable of the, two prayer, of the two people that went to pray before God? There was the Republican, the thief, and then there was the Pharisee. Two worshippers walk before God, the, the, the Pharisee and the, uh, the, the publican. The Pharisee lifts up his head. He says, I am not like this other person. I tithe. I do this. I do all this stuff. And, all that, and I thank you, God, for giving me this ability. So he offers the thanksgiving offering of Cain instead of the broken nature of Abel. Because this other person, the, the publican, when he prays before God, this thief who is a thief before God, is, he does not even dare lift up his face before God because he knows himself as a sinner. And he says, help me, God. He's beating his chest. His posture is downward. He says, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And Jesus says, this man, I tell you, verily, verily, I say this unto you, that this man went home justified justification by faith so in Ezra chapter 9 verse 6 we find this it says I say unto you oh my God I am ashamed and I blush to lift up my face before thee oh my God for my iniquities are increased over my head and my transgression is grown down is go, is grown up unto the heavens this is the posture of God's people this is a posture of God's bride Listen to what Job says in Job. Let's look at another picture because we're looking at all these patriarchs. We're looking at all these prophets. We're looking at all these writings to give us a true picture of the posture that we need to have as God's people, especially on the Day of Atonement. Listen to what Job says in Job. Remember, Job is an example of God's people. James tells us that there is the patience of Job and what he went through that is going to be a type, which is an anti-type of God's people. Listen to what it says in Job chapter 40, this one. We'll read 40, this one through to four. Listen to what it says. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, this is God speaking to Job. Remember, Job has been having a conversation with his friends and all that, but God comes on the scene. He answers Job and saying, what shall he, shall he that contends with the almighty instruct him? And he that reproves God, let him answer it. This is when he is facing God and God begins to speak back to Job. Listen to what he says in verse 3. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vow. Behold, I am vow. What shall I answer thee? I lay my hands upon my mouth. Job says, Behold, I am vow before you. Who are we before God? Who do we think we are before God? Job, the very man that God says this man is upright and perfect, when he stands before God, he sees himself as vowed. That is his position before God. He says, I am vow. What shall I answer you? I put my mouth on my, I put my hands on my mouth. I do not have anything to say unto you. This is the picture of what Romans chapter 3, verse 19 tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Listen to what he says. And now we know that what things the law saith, it says to them that are under the law. The law condemns us and brings us to this shamefacedness. It brings us to the reality of who we are. The law exposes the sinfulness that is in our hearts. Listen to what it says. It says to them that are under the law. Everyone is under the law. It says that every mouth should be stopped. This is Job's picture. Because the law is going to show us when we stand before God, when we stand before the law of God, it, show us, it shows us the vileness that is in us. 
all our comeliness turns into corruption. This is the picture of Daniel. When Daniel stood before an angel of God, his comeliness, we're talking about Daniel here, my friends, his comeliness was turned into what? Corruption. And he fell down as a dead man before an angel of God. Just, 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 that's just an angel of God. How about if I stand before an infinite eternal God? Even in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah stood before God, he says, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I live among us people of unclean lips. The true revelation of who we are is revealed when we encounter God. And this is the picture that we are seeing that this woman is having this, the, the, the pomegranate picture of her cheeks. She is ashamed before God. And that's what Job says. He says, behold, I am vow. What shall I answer thee? My, that every mouth be, be stopped and all the wow. Listen to what Romans chapter 3 verse 19 says. It says that every mouth should be stopped, that all the world, not just part of the world, not just the Jewish people, not just Christians, not just Buddhists, not just the people that are outside the church, everyone, including those that have been justified before God. Listen to what it says, that all the world might, be, might become guilty before God. Everyone is a liar. God is the only one who is true. Everyone is fake. God is the only one that is real and reality. So let's go back to the book of Job now. Job chapter, chapter 40, verse 5 it says, Once I have spoken. Job says, Once I have spoken, but, but I will not answer. Why? Because he's standing before the Almighty. I will not answer, yea, twice, and I will not proceed any further. This is the picture of what it means to stand before God. In Job chapter 42, verse 6, again, Job says, says, Wherefore I adhor myself, I love, not love, but love myself. Now, we're living in a generation at the time where people talk about loving yourself and self-love and all this. All the self-love that we talk about today, this spirit of this generation is actually selfishness. And this is contrary to what the scriptures say about us when we stand before God, when God inquires us, when we think our counsel is more potent than the counsel of God. Because here Job contends with God. Listen to what he says in Job chapter 42, verse 6 says, Wherefore I had whole myself and I repent in dust and in ashes. This is what is lacking amongst the body of Christ, to see ourselves, because we think we are of value because we are Christians. But listen, outside Christ, we are nothing. Job says, I at home myself. Listen to what Psalm says. We're still talking about the posture of this bride and the right posture that God wants us to have as we live in these end times. Listen to what it says in Psalm chapter 50, 51, verse 17. It says this. It says, the sacrifice of God, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thy will not despise. If there's something that God does not despise is a broken and contrite heart, a broken spirit. But we all want to appear, we have this facade. We always want to appear that we are okay, we are fine, we are holy, we're doing very well and all this, even when everything is breaking down before us. Even when our marriage is on the rocks, we want to appear a facade. We create this facade of perfection as Christians. But God says, a broken and contrite heart, I will not despise. I will not despise. These are the sacrifices that are acceptable unto God. But what do we want to do? We want to offer Cain's sacrifice and say, thank you, God, for blessing me, for making me holy, for making me more righteous, for making me give you tithe, for making you do this, for making me this, for making me a beautiful singer and all this. These are what we want to offer. These are the sacrifices of Cain. It's not the brokenness of Abel. Abel offered a broken lamb before God. The one that was bleeding in acceptance of his duty before God. But we want to appear to be Cain and to be okay, the religious of Cain. Since the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, that will not despise. 
Listen to what Daniel says. This is Daniel when he's, he's praying this prayer. This cooperative prayer that we find in the book of Daniel chapter 9 verse 7. It says, O oh God, righteousness belongs unto thee. There is only one who is righteous. So don't think because you have some insights about somebody else, you can stand in judgment of them. You don't sit that high. That high. You're not the most high to look down on others. There's only one who sits that high and he never looks down on anybody else. Even when Mary was caught in the act, what was his disposition towards Mary? Listen to what Daniel says in Daniel chapter 9 verse 7. He says, O Lord, righteousness belongs unto thee, but unto us. This is what belongs to us, Daniel says. This is Daniel, we're talking about the prophet of God, the very beloved of God. It says, but unto us confusion of faces, the blushing, the picture of the pomegranate, the readying of the, of, of the temple of the, of, the, of, the, of the cheeks. It says, confusion of faces as at this day unto the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He's talking about it's not even talking about Babylon. It's not talking about the Philistines. It's not talking about the Moabites. It's not talking about these people that are outside the realm of Christianity. But he's actually talking about the house of God. Listen to what he says. He says, unto the men of Judah, unto the in inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel. How much of Israel? Everyone. And that are near and they that are far off through all the countries where if you have driven because of their transgression, they have transgressed against thee. Looks like I'm going to struggle with space in my phone. They have transgressed against thee. So this is the picture. This is the true picture of God's bride, God's people. Because remember, God's bride is a composition of God's people. They are posture before God. It's a picture of the pomegranate fruit that is red on the outside. The reddishness is the blushing, the shame that they feel. The opposite, if you want to see that you're not on God's side, you're not on God's people, God's bride. You don't align with Daniel. You don't align with Isaiah. You don't align with Job and all these others. The opposite is the whole's forehead. And we need to talk about the, the whole's forehead. And we see it in the, in the verses. Listen to what Jeremiah says. The opposite. The one who is opposite to the bride of Christ. Listen to what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter Chapter 6, we'll read verse uh, 16, 15. He says, Well, this is a question that is being posed. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Are we ashamed when we have committed abomination? The answer is nay. They were not ashamed at all. They were not all ashamed. Neither could they blush. That is the picture of the pomegranate, the reading. Of our faces, neither could they blush. It says, therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. In the general destruction of everyone, you will be part of that. It says, at that time that I will visit them, they shall be cast down, just like the devil was cast down. That saved the Lord himself. In Jeremiah, listen to what it says. This is the opposite picture of the God's bride. Listen to what it says in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 3. It says, Wherefore, the showers are withholden. We're talking about the latter rain, yeah? We're talking about receiving Pentecost part 2. Receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit corporately as God's people. Listen to what it says. Wherefore, therefore, the showers are withholden. And there has been no latter rain. Why? Why is there no latter rain? Listen to the answer. It says, because you have a horse forehead. You have the mindset of a prostitute. What is the mindset of the prostitute? God's people are developing a mindset of a prostitute. What is the mindset of a prostitute? You refuse to be ashamed. There is no shame. No shame whatsoever. So just looking at this verse in Songs of Songs chapter 6, which is the focus of our study today. Songs of Songs chapter 6 verse 7. 
it gives us the idea that God's bride or Christ's bride, God's people, is a composition of the shem facedness bride. So there's a shem facedness bride. Remember that her hair is laid down, and then inside the locks of her hair, there's a picture of uh, the reddishness of her face because she's ashamed. And God points out the posture of God's people. Listen to what it says. Just looking at this verse, it gives us the idea that the bride of Christ is a shamefacedness bride. In Songs of Songs, chapter 6, verse 7, which is the mother of this study, as a piece of the pomegranate picture, the pomegranate fruit, which is red on the outside. It says, thy cheeks are within thy locks. So the cheeks, her cheeks are as red as the pomegranates. Her locks, her hair, the locks of her hair, are laid down covering her cheeks. She's not mounting up her hair down there to show that she's so proudful. But the hair is laid down to cover her cheeks. This is a picture of Mary Magdalene. Go back to the story of Mary, Mary Magdalene, the one who went to Magdalene, and Magdalene was where this hair braiding was being done, and that's where she went and became a prostitute, Mary Magdalene. Eventually, she was Mary of Bethany, and we talked about this in the previous, in the other studies, right? So it's a picture of Mary Magdalene, her hair that she laid down. Remember when she came into the room? And got that expensive perfume of the alabaster box and entered and laid down her hair. Her hair, remember the hair in the Bible is a symbol of glory. She's not lifting up herself in glory, but she's laid down her hair. On Mary Magdalene is a picture of Christ's bride. It's a picture of Christ's people corporately. And their posture before God is that they lay down their hair, their glory down and wiping the feet of Jesus. They know they're the sinners. Mary knew she was a sinner. And when she was anointing the feet of Jesus and laying down her glory on the ground, remember righteousness by faith is laying down the glory of man into the dust. Man has got no glory, all glory belongs unto God. This is the picture of, the, of Christ's bride. Now, let's look at the pomegranate itself. Now, there are different things that are mentioned in the book of Numbers. If you read Numbers chapter 20, verse 5, you'll find that the vine, the figs, and the pomegranates are mentioned as fruits of Israelites that were missing when they were in the wilderness. Let's read the book of Numbers. Let's look at this picture of the pomegranate. We'll spend much more time on the seeds that are packed in blood. You see where the study is going. Listen, it says in the book of Numbers chapter 20, verse 5, it says, Wherefore have ye made us to be to come out of Israel, to come up out of Israel, to come out, out of Egypt, and to bring us here unto evil, unto this evil place. So they were complaining and saying, You brought us out of Egypt and you brought us unto this evil place, the wilderness, the dry place. It says, It is no place of seed. They couldn't see Christ in the wilderness, their seed itself. It says of the figs, of the vine, or of the pomegranate, they didn't see that. Neither is there any water to drink. The promised land itself also, when you read Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 8, you find the promised land where they were going to. It was a land of wheat, of barley, of vine, of the fig trees, and of the pomegranates. So the pomegranates, which have been, uh, it's, an important, it's an important element of God's promise, the pomegranate itself. And you see the seeds, when we start talking about the seeds and the promise itself. So now let's look at the inside of the pomegranate. Because remember, this is a fruit which is reddish on the outside. And then inside, it's got these seeds that are packed in red, sweet in test. Okay, so let's look at the inside. What's the inside this? So these are seeds that are packed in red. And we're saying this is the picture of the seed that is sacrificed in blood. The seed that is sacrificed in blood. And we'll look at what that blood is and what that seed is. Right. So in Genesis, there's the first intimation 
of the seed in Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 15. There's the first intimation of the seed. This is the gospel that was preached. Listen to what it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed, the one seed and her seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this is the first intimation of the gospel picture of the seed that is going to come. This is the seed that is packed in blood. Follow me closely. Now let's look at the seed. Let's go back and look at the parable of Jesus. When he talks about the parable of the sower, the sower comes to sow seeds. And these seeds are packed in blood. Listen, listen to the parable. We look at different version of this parable because it's very important that Luke had to mention it, Mark had to mention it, and also Matthew had to mention it. So we we'll look at from the vision of Luke, from the vision of Matthew, and just a little bit from the vision of Mark, right? Let's look at these seeds that are packed and this, this parable of the sower. So in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 8, there's 4, we'll read through to 8. Listen to what it says. This is the sower. We're talking about the seed, guys. The seed. That is mentioned. Listen to what it says. In Luke chapter 8, verse 4, it says, And when much people were gathered together, that's a very important picture. And when much people were gathered together, they came unto they came, they came to him out of every city, and they spoke by a parable unto them. So the people are gathered, and then Jesus begins to speak by a parable unto them. Listen to what he says. In verse 5, it says, The sower went out to sow his seed, one seed. And as he sown, some fell on the way, and some were trodden under, and the fowls of the air devoured them. This is a picture that he gives us. So as he was sowing, some fell on the way, the way, they did fell on the way, but they were trodden down. They were trodden down, brought back to the earth, <laughs> earthy, and the fowls of the air devoured them. Now, the fowls of the air, it's a picture of these foul spirits. Remember, Babylon has become a cage of these foul spirits, these demonic forces that begin to devour the seed that has fallen on the way, and then they're trodden down. Listen to what it says in verse 6. It says, and some fell upon a rock. Hmm, a rock. And as soon as it sprang up, this is the seed. As soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. They did fell on the rock. That was the right thing. Fell on the rock. But what did it lack? It lacked moisture. And moisture is the picture of what? It's the picture of the Holy Spirit. The moisture, the rain that comes. To moisture so that it can spring up. Right? So it withered away because it lacked moisture. Listen to what it says in verse 7. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up, sprang it up with it and choked it. You see the interpretation of the thorns, the dry ground, and all this stuff, right? Let's read, them, let's read verse 8 of, songs of uh, Luke. Luke chapter 8, verse 8. And others fell on good grounds. And sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had these, he cried. And it says, and when he had said this, these things, he cried. This is Jesus crying. Okay, the Bible is very specific about the tone that he was using. So he cried. And what did he say? He that is in here, let him hear. Let him hear. He that is in here, let him hear. This is the same thing that is mentioned in the book of Revelation when it says, He that is in here, let him hear what the Spirit says. So there's a spiritual lesson that God wants us to get just from this. But let's look at Matthew's vision. We're going to put this vision all together. We just looked at Luke's vision of the seed vision and the parable of the seed. Let's look at Matthew's vision, right? Matthew says this in Matthew chapter, chapter 13, there's, there's two. We read through up to seven. It says, And the great multitude... There and and the great multitude were gathered together unto him. The great multitude, my friend, always gathered unto Jesus. They don't gather around the ideas that we have about Jesus. They must gather around Jesus. 
unless there is Jesus, your gatherings are useless, worthless, and of, of, of toxicity unto us. Listen to what it says, and the, and the great multitude. Remember, there's a great multitude that is mentioned in the book of Revelation. I'm trying to speak to you as Bible students to go back and look at these things as well. It says, and the great multitude were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shores. That's a picture that we're given. And then he says, and he spoke many things unto them in parables, saying, behold, a saw went forth to saw. And when he had sown, some fell by the way, and the fowls of the air devoured them. And some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. This is important because Matthew is giving us more information on what we just saw in the book of Luke. He says they fell where? And some fell on stony places where they were not they did not have much earth. There wasn't much soil. There wasn't much earth. And wherewith they sprang up, when they sprang up, what happened? Because they did not, they, they had no deepness of earth. They were choked out. And when the sun came out in verse 6 of Matthew chapter 6, listen to what it says, and because they did not have much deepness of earth, we'll talk about what that means. Because they did not have much deepness of earth, when the sun, the judgment, the sun is the judge, the, the all-seeing eye, it says when the sun, judgment, came up, they were scorched because they had no roots, they withered away. So this deepness, these, these seeds that fell on the stony places that did not have much earth, what does that mean? They did not understand the earthiness. They did not go deeper to see. They did not allow the Holy Spirit to show them their earthliness, the deepness of how sinful we are as human beings. That's the earthy. We come from the dust. To the dust we go. Remember the woman with her hair laid down. The hair which is black. It's a revelation of the nature of man. How sinful we are. Because the Holy Spirit does an inventory of our souls. And that inventory of our souls is showing us all the, the deceit deceitfulness of our hearts. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We don't go too deep to understand how, 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 how sinful we are as human beings. We don't allow the word of God to do that. We want to flatter ourselves. I always say this in, in, even in the previous studies that, listen, the Holy Spirit does not flatten us. It flattens us. Back on the ground, back to the dust. Your only hope is in the seed, the only one. So these that when the judgment comes and we did not have an inventory of our souls to see how sinful we are and that we cry to only one man and that one man is Jesus. When the judgment comes, we shall be scorched and destroyed because there was no deepness of earth. We didn't understand the sinfulness of our nature. So that we could cry to the only one whose nature is perfect, and that's Jesus. Let's go on. It says this in verse 7. It says, it says, And some fell among the thorns. Now the thorns and the thorns, when they sprang up, they choked them. In Mark, it gives us what these thorns are. Listen to me. In Mark, it gives us what these thorns are. Listen to what Mark says in Mark's version of the thorns. In Mark chapter 4, verse 18, it says, And these are they that were sown among the thorns. They, they that do hear the word of God. And the cares of this world. Listen now. Listen now. These are the thorns that chalk the word of God out of us. The cares of this world. What are the cares of this world? Oh, I need money. Oh, my finances. My education, the cares of this world, my marriage, my relationship, the cares of this world, the cares of this world, 
And the, deceitful, the deceitfulness or the deceitfulness of riches. Oh, I need to get all the money. I need to do this. I need to chase after this. I need to pursue the rush, the rush, the rush after the money. And the only person you're not pursuing is Jesus. The cares of this world, the entrepreneurship world of this world, right? The cares of this world and the last of all other things entered in and choked the word. And it became unfruitful. No fruits. Because we cared so much about what's going on in this world. Listen, your marriage can be on the rocks and you can still secure your atonement with God. You can be poor and still secure your atonement with God. Your body can be looking like a sack bag and still secure your atonement with God. God has made every provision for everyone to secure the atonement with God, regardless of what's happening in this world. The cares of this world come in and they choke away the word of who? The word of God. They choke away the word of God and we are not fruitful. I'm trying to find my hand. I can't find it. And we're not fruitful because of that. So I want you to begin to understand that even in the pursuit of whatever you're pursuing, your degree, your master's, oh, I'm a doctor, I'm this and all that, the cares of this world, you care about your name, your reputation and all this, that is going to choke away the word of God. It will choke away the word of God and you will become unfruitful. Fit for what? What does Jesus say in John chapter 5 about the branches that are not, are not fruitful? He chops them off, then they're fit for the fires. So let's go back to the book of Matthew now. In Matthew chapter, chapter 13, this 8, it says, But others fell on good grounds. What is a good ground? A good ground is not, it's a ground, my friend. It's a sinful ground. You come from the earth, to the earth you shall return. It's a sinful ground. It's full of all these sins and all that. That's where we come from. They fell on good ground. Good grounds is ground that yields to the seeds, surrenders to the seed, allows the seed. That's a good ground. It's on a sinless ground. It allows the seed. It has interaction with the seed. It accepts the seed. The seed that is packed in blood, that's the good ground. Fell into good grounds and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold and some six hundred. And then th this, this, this multiplication that is happening here is as a result of allowing the seed that is packed in blood. I'm going to read to you from the Spirit of Prophecy now. We're going to read uh, Cross Object Lesson, page 37. 39. Listen to this because it gives us insight into the parable itself, the parable of the sower going out to sow. Listen to what it says. Everything, it says, ever since the fall of man, Adam and Eve, Christ has, has been the revealer of truth to the world. So Christ comes to reveal the truth about our natures when he comes into this world, the truth about himself, the truth about the devil. There's the truth about who I am when I stand before God. The poster is that I am ashamed. I am ashamed. I blush before him. That's Job's posture. I had hold myself. But we think, oh, I can stand in the presence of God. And do that. all the prophets that stood in the prophet in the in the presence of God, they say, I am undone. All my goodness turns into nothingness. Everyone that stood in the presence of God cried out that. Listen to what it says. Ever since the fall of man, Christ had been the revealer of truth to the world. You reveal the truth, they will not like you. By him, the incorruptible seed, the seed that is in the pomegranate, that is incorruptible, the seed that is packed with blood, that royal blood that was sacrificed on the cross of Calvary, that exalted blood, because you see what the word pomegranate means when we get to it. So it says, by him, the incorruptible seed, no corruption in him, the word of God, he is the word of God, the seed itself, which liveth and abideth forever. He is the one that lives and abides forever is communicated to man. He is communicating himself to us. God is not hiding himself. 
in first peter we're told that in first peter chapter 1 verse 23 it says listen to to what the quotation says it continues in that in that first promise spoken to our fallen rest in eden that first promise when he says i'm going to give you the seed and the seed shall we looked at that verse in uh, in genesis chapter 3 verse 15 christ was sowing the gospel seed so when he talked about the seed which shall come and bruise the head of the serpent that is the gospel seed, the good news seed. And the good news is that there's only one seed that will triumph. Everybody else will fail, but this one seed will triumph. And everything else is in this one seed. Reality is in this one seed. Life is in this one seed. Life is folded into this one seed. Everything else is borrowing its existence to this one seed. But it was his personal ministry among men and to the work which he thus established in the parable of the sower. So he was talking about his ministry, why he came. He came to sow the seeds. The kingdom of God is at hand, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand, repent. We can challenge with. So listen to what he says. He says, the word of God is the seed. So if you read the word of God, you're reading God made audible is Jesus Christ. The word of God is the seed. So the word of God is the seed. Every seed has in it a germinating principle. When you get a seed, it has in it a germinating principle. The question is, where does it get that germinating principle from? What gives it life to germinate? Remember, Jesus Christ says, no one can take my life. <laughs> I can uh, I give myself voluntarily and I can actually bring myself up because I have life in me, original and borrowed. He's got life in him. That germinating principle, the seed is in him. Listen to what he says. It is, it is the life of the plant enfolded. So there is life in God's word. Now, this is not the magic way we think when I read God's word, blah, 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 then I come this mystical way. No, in God's word, the word is Jesus. Because we might be like the, the Pharisees of Jesus' time or the scribes that were, were meticulous in studying the Bible, in understanding the Bible, that they them be able to court the the Old Testament, the five books of Moses, be able to court them. But when Jesus Christ came, he says, no, 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 no. You guys, you read the Bible, for in them you think you have eternal life, but it is they that testify of me. You don't come to me so that you might have life. I, I am the life. You think, you think by just reading the words you have life? This is not some magical, mystical thing. Life is in me. In me, I am life. That's what Jesus Christ told them. I am the resurrection and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. You, 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 you do not just read the Bible. For You think by reading the Bible and you get all your words and you're able to quote words, you actually have me. You don't have me because you don't come to me. I am the life. He told them that and he called them, ye are of your father, the devil. These are people that master the Bible. We should ask ourselves when we read the Bible, what are we doing? Are we just reading, oh, the promises of God are unto me, unto me. We don't know the promise of God is one person. It's him. And you see the verse that we're going to read as we go into the study. It says, the word that I speak unto you, Jesus says, it says, the word that I speak unto you in John chapter 6, verse 63, says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that I speak unto you, not what you speak, but that I speak. The originator of the words, me, who speaks. These are spirits because I am spiritual. You're not spiritual. You're carnal, sword under sin, under, unto death. People think, oh, I am a spiritual person having uh, a human experience. No, 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 no. You are carnal, sword under death. The only one who speaks spiritual thing is the one who is spiritual, and that's Jesus. It's the words that I speak, not what you speak. Because you speak words, and there is nothing to your words. They're just words. But the words that I speak, they are life. 
Jesus says that. The words that I speak unto you, they're life. And he that hears my, my words, Jesus says. It's a specific word, my words. And believeth on him that sent me, the Father, has everlasting life. Why? Because I am everlasting life. That's John chapter 5, verse 24. And in every command of God, every command that you're going to read in the Bible, every command that proceeds out of the mouth of God, and in every promise of the word of God is the power, the very life of God. This life of God is in the seed which is packed with blood because the life of an animal is in the blood. So when he says in every, listen, in every command and in every promise of the word of God is the power. The life, the very life of God. This is the life that is in the blood by which the command may be fulfilled and the promise may be realized. It's in the word. It's not in, in me and me quoting it. And all. It's not magic, guys. Jesus does not dabble in magic. He's not a magician. The words that he speaks are life in themselves because he is life. He has life in him, original, unborrowed, underived. That is who we are given. He who by faith, this is how we receive. Listen to what it says. He who by faith receives the word, receives the very life and character of God. How do we receive it? By faith. My faith? No, the faith of Jesus. By faith. When I receive it, I receive the very life and the character of God. So these are the seeds that are packed in blood. That royal blood, that exalted blood on the cross of Calvary. When Jesus Christ was dying, that was the exaltation, the promise, the pledge of our deliverance. That royal blood that was that was that was that was shed on the cross of Calvary, that exalted blood. Even the word pomegranate itself, the word itself translated in, from the Hebrew into the English means exalted. It's used three times when it means to be exalted, to be lifted up two times, to get up one time, to mount up one time. So it's about this blood which is exalted. If you look at the pomegranate tree itself, it's a an upright tree, it's upright, exalted, mounted up with all these beautiful uh, 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 scarlet red fruits that I've got, these seeds that are packed in blood. So it's a picture of the upright one, the one that is the seed, the one that is the seed that is packed in the royal infinite blood of Jesus. There is power in that blood. Outside that blood, there is no power. Now, let's look at the elements. We go now to the elements of the pomegranates on the helm of the garment of the high priest. Remember, when you go back and look at the garment of the high priest, the, the, the garment that he wore, it had these pomegranates that were woven with a blue, scarlet, and purple into the, the, the fabric of the, of the garment that he was wearing. On the helm of his garments, on the edge of his garments, there were these pomegranates, a bell and pomegranates, a bell and pomegranates, a golden bell and pomegranates. Let's read that from the scriptures so that you know that I'm not just saying or making this up, right? Let's read uh, Exodus chapter 20, 28, verse 30. 28. It's, it's, it's a very important study because it orients us to trust in the word of God. In Exodus chapter Let's look at this picture in Exodus chapter 28, there's 33, sorry, there's 33, we'll read through up to verse uh, 35. Listen to what it says. And beneath, this is a description of the garment that he was going to wear. It says, and beneath upon the helm of it, you shall make pomegranates of blue, of purple, of scarlet. All those colors are very important. Spend time looking at the blue, the royal blue, the purple, the royal purple and the scarlet, the red part of it. it says round about the helm thereof and the barrel of, of, of gold between around about. So they were to make these pomegranate picture of blue purple scarlet and then a barrel of gold. 
continuing it says, and a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the helm of the robe around about. Remember, this is the robe of the high priest. Who is our high priest? Jesus. And we're talking about day of atonement. When he's about to enter, in, when he has entered into the most holy place to make that oneness, to obtain his bride. He's wearing this vestiture where there is the golden bell and the pomegranate. A golden bell and the pomegranate. A golden bell, pomegranate. Going to hear me? Pomegranate, right? Listen to what it says in verse 35 of, of uh, Exodus chapter 28. It says, and it shall be upon Aaron. Remember, Aaron is the high priest picture. He is the type of the antitype. He is role playing the ministry of Christ as the high priest. Aaron and then he says, and it shall be upon Aaron to minister and his sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy, the most holy place or the holy place before the Lord and he shall come out that he die not. So without the golden bell and the pomegranate and the sound of the bell, when they were hearing the sound of the bell, they knew he was alive. He was alive. It was the promise of God. And the pomegranate. So the golden bell would hit into the pomegranate. That silent promise hit into the cotton wool. That silent, I mean, hit into each other. And they make this beautiful sound knowing he's alive. When the high priest is alive, because he liveth, we shall live forever. Because this high priest, you see, as we go into the study, I'm excited because it begins to reveal to us our hope is in that one being. Listen, these pastors that preach about about denominational lines and all this stuff and all that. Yes, denomination lines are very important. But when we talk about the most holy place experience, we're not talking about our experience. We're talking about the experience of the high priest into the most holy place. So it's not about, oh, it's us into the most holy place now, and it's our story now. It's not the Anabaptist. It's not all this stuff and all that. No, no, we're talking about the story of one man who has entered as our only hope. It's not you and me. It's his story. We enter in there by faith. He carries us on, on his breastplate of his righteousness. That is the picture of how we enter there. Without him entering there, we have no access into the most holy place. So let's not get hooked up with all this blueprint. It's us it will go in there. Let's do the work. And get over that. Get to Jesus, the real being who stands before the throne of God. I don't mean to rant, but we are missing the picture. We think it's about us into the most holy place. And we are the ones to finish the work. We are the, nah, it's about him. How about if we forget about us and talk about Jesus? How about if we do that? Let's see what happens. Because Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw Every man unto me. The great multitude comes in because he is the one that is lifted up. But oh, we think, oh, it's, it's about us, our denomination, our understanding. And, and oh, it's about us being the blueprint, right? Pathetic religion that we've indulged ourselves into. Because we've trodden the truth to the ground. We are the ground. We're not the substance. Jesus is the substance. And we get glory to ourselves, our denominations, our pastors. Oh, he did the blueprint. Have you, have you heard the blueprint? And some, some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't. But you get the idea. It's not about the human beings. It's about Jesus. Let's get over the wine of Babylon and come back to the reality. It's not about us. It's all about him. We've made Christianity about us. You wonder why we have no power? Power to influence and change things? Nothing. Because we think it's about you. It's about me getting the glory. So let's, let's go back to our study now. So he shall minister that he die not. There's death involved. Listen, if... If the high priest does not minister properly, there's death involved. No one would enter into the most holy place. Why don't we understand that except the high priest? But we think, oh, we are now the denomination that has entered. We're in the final lapse of everything, right? 
<laughs> Pathetic religion. Let's go to the book of Luke. Remember, we talked about the hem of his garment, the hem of the garment of the high priest with the golden bells and the pomegranate. Let's look at the story of the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garments and what happened to her. Let's look at Luke. Let's look at what Luke says. In Luke chapter 8, there's 43 to 40, 43, 43 and 40, 44. Listen to what it says. And a woman had an issue of blood. Now, remember, we're talking about the bride of Christ. That's a picture of the woman, right? A woman had an issue of blood 12 years. The 12 tribes of Israel had an issue of blood. The 12 disciples, an issue of blood. It's a picture of God's people having issues with blood. Of life. Whose life? Whose blood? Says which? Says this woman had an issue of blood, 12 years, which had spent all. What did she spend all? She worked all her living upon physicians. So she went to this doctor and this other doctor and spent all the money. I, in my therapy practice, I've met people. Actually, I've met one woman with an issue of blood in real life. And she's been all over. She went to this pastor. She went to this church. She went to this nanga. She went to this Healer, she wants to do these different pictures, different people. This is the picture. I met a woman. I'm just telling you, I met an actual woman with an issue of blood. And when I entered the room to speak to her, the anxiety that just, the darkness that just covered the room. It was quite telling. And that's the picture of us as human beings. We have an issue of blood. Says this woman with an issue of blood has been all over, spent all her living upon physicians, and neither of them could heal any or take away the, the, the issue of blood. So she went to this doctor and this other doctor, she went to TB Joshua, she went all over the place. Yeah. Neither of them could take away because we trust personalities. Oh, he's a doctor. You see, these doctors that wear these white robes. <laughs> Uh, but she had to touch one person's robe, not the doctor's white robe. Because now we trust our doctors, even during COVID. Like some of these doctors are not educated. Sorry to say, but some of them, or should I say, a um, majority of them are just indoctrinated. They are not educated. And we trust whatever they tell us, yeah? So she went upon every physician and went all over. And what happened? None of them could heal any. And then in Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, verse 44, it says, came behind him, she came behind Jesus and touched the border of his garment. She didn't trust the white coats of the doctors. She trusted the borders of his garment. I wonder what she touched. Did she touch the blue pomegranate picture? Maybe she did. This is the high priest. Who knows? She touched the border of his garment and immediately, what happened? An issue of blood was stanched. It stopped. We no longer have issues of blood when we touch the pomegranate with the seeds packed in the actual royal blood that is accepted before Christ, that is accepted before God. She touched it and immediately the blood it was trust, it was faith, it was a touch of faith. By faith, she reached out, I'm going to touch him. I am tired going to these physicians that cannot heal me, that provide false remedies, right? In Jeremiah, we're taught about these false prophets. False prophets. We have a new religion, it's called science. And it has its doctors, its priests, its high priests who wear courts, white courts. And we trust them more that we trust the word of God than Jesus. Yes, we do. Listen to what Jeremiah chapter 8 says. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14, listen to what it says. And they, the false prophets, they healed also the head of the daughter of my people slightly. So they don't heal you completely, it's slightly, so that you come back, you see, make profit on you. 
slightly, and they say peace, peace, and when there is no peace. So they will heal you slightly, and then they'll say, peace, you've been healed, you've received your vaccination, now you're okay. Hmm. Then you're at peace. They say, peace, peace, do you know what peace is? Peace is Solomon, shalom, shalom. They say, now you have a Solomon, now you have a husband, now you have somebody that can cover you. So they say, peace, 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 peace is Solomon. They present to you a different healer who doesn't heal you. The false physicians with their white robes <laughs> instead of the robe of the righteousness of Jesus that heals completely and stays the blood issue that we have. So in the book of Ruth, we have another picture of a woman touching the helm or being covered by the garment of a kingsman redeemer. Listen to what it says in the book of Ruth. In Ruth chapter, chapter 3, verse 9, it says, And he said, Who art thou? This is when... He was sleeping, Boaz was sleeping, and then Ruth comes and she sleeps at the feet of Boaz. It's a picture of Mary at the feet of who? Of Jesus. With her hair laid down in shame. And then Boaz says this, Boaz says, who art thou? Who are you? And she answered and says, I am Ruth, thy hands made. I am your servant. She does not come and say, I am this, I know this, I know this. And then, no, no, no. She says, I am your husband. I am your servant. That's all I am. I am your servant. See, women, that is beautiful. <laughs> not these modern Eves that we have that I am independent. I can do my own thing. And they go off wandering and mating with serpents. Modern Eves. But this woman says, I am your husband. It's beautiful. And then she says, spread before, therefore your skirt over my, over thy hands, mate. I am yours. Spread your skirt, your garment over me. That was a tradition in the East when they spread the, the skirt. It's a picture of, I cover you. I will protect you, protect you, provide for you. And I'll be there for you. It's a husband's picture that I'm going to cover you under me. That thou, because it says, spread your skirt over your hands, man, for you. At my nearest king's redeemer. Your nearest king's man. You're close to me. You're like my brother. In Zechariah, we find another picture of a woman who's been covered. We need the helm. We need the, the, the garment that needs the skirt of the garment of the high priest to cover. We're about to finish our study now. Listen to what it says. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 18, it says, When... Now, when I pass over thee, this is God speaking about his bride and how it's a beautiful Ezekiel chapter 16, beautiful picture of where we come from and how many people have neglected you. But when Jesus Christ came and saw his bride covered an umbilical cord and cut and all this, he came and he did something to her. Listen to what he says in verse, verse, verse 8 in Ezekiel. It says, now when I passed by thee, I looked upon thee, I looked upon thee and behold, it was your time for love. And when it was your time for love, what did I do? I spread my skirt over you and I covered thy nakedness. What does God cover us? Our nakedness. He covers us. He covers us. And yea, I sweared upon thee. And I sweared unto thee. He swore. He took an oath. This is God making an oath. He took an oath and entered into a covenant. Does God have to swear for us to believe him? No. But you see why he swore, why he swore. It was a guarantee to us. And he entered into a covenant with thee. And that said the Lord that you have become mine. You see, there's that sense of belonging. You belong to me. But many people don't want to be owned. They don't want to belong. Well, you wander off like a, like a demonic spirit from here and there because you don't want to belong. You have no place to stay, no place to rest. You can call it your home. You need a man. <laughs> you need a man. And Jesus says, when I found you, you were wandering. Your father was a Hittite. Your mother was a Canaanite. They all rejected you and left you to die. And to die in your own chalk of your own vomit and all this. They left you, umbilical cord was uncut. When I found you, I dressed you up. You grew up, your breasts protrude. And when I saw you, it was your time for love. And I came to cover you. And I made a covenant with you. 
and you became mine. You're mine, I own you. The devil does not own you, I own you. You're mine. It's either you realize that now or later when it's too late. So let's see this swearing. God swears. He says, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant. Let's see this swearing of God is making a covenant in the book of Hebrews. This is where we're going to end. We're going to end in the book of Hebrews. I hope so. We're going to end in the book of Hebrews. So Hebrews says, God is making a covenant with this woman. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, we read through, I think, up to 20. Listen to what it says. I'm going to be slow because I want us to get the gist of this word of God. It says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, because he swear by he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. This is God swearing by himself. There's nobody greater than God. So God begins to swear by himself. Why is God swearing? Saying, surely blessing I will bless thee. This is the sure reality. Blessing, I will bless thee. And multiplying, I will multiply you. And also, listen to what he says in verse 15. He says, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So there's patience, there's endurance. He obtained the promise. And so it says in verse 16, for, for men verily swear by the greater. So when, I, when we swear, we swear by the greater. We swear by all this. We swear by all this stuff and all that. It says, and an oath for a confirmation is to them an end of all strife. So when men make an oath, it's an end of all strife. As I swear, then there is peace and all this. In an end of all strife. But how does God end the strife that we have with him? How do we gain peace, Solomon, with God? Listen to what he says. Where, where in God, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17, he says, Where in God, willing more abundantly, those words are very important, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of, the, of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it with an oath. His counsel, he confirmed it with an oath. Unto this immutability, there is no one who can change this. The reality that we've been given in this one gift. Listen to what it says. It says, which, it says, in verse, verse 18, it says, by, it says, that by two immutable things, by how many? Two immutable things. In which it was impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. Every man is a liar. Let God be true. But by two immutable things in which it was impossible for him to lie, we might have a strong consolation. A strong consolation. What consolation? Who, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. There is a hope that is said not inside us, but before us. You get me clearly now. It's not this mystic way of the hope that is in you and you feel it. It's the hope that is set before you, outside of you, outside of your experience and your pathetic religious experience. There's a hope that is set before you, outside of you. There's a reality outside of you. It's not subjective, it's objective, it's outside of you. It's objective because anybody else can look to that hope that is a strong consolation. Listen to what it says, continuing it says. Which hope we have an anchor of the soul. Where are you going to anchor your soul? So this hope is where you anchor your soul. Both sure and steadfast. Look at all these assuring, assuring words. It's sure, sure. It's steadfast, fastened. Both sure and steadfast, which enter, entereth into within the veil. We just read from the book of Exodus how the high priest enters into within the veil. That is our hope. It's not you that enters, Ivor Myers. It is him that enters. That is our hope. He is our hope. And we have that strong consolation in him. 
which hope we enter, it is an anchor for us, both sure and steadfast, which entered into within the veil, that veil of the high priest who is wearing the garment of the pomegranate, who has entered into there. That is a strong consolation. Verse 20 of Hebrews chapter 6 says, Wherewith the forerunner, he is the forerunner, the one that goes before us in the presence of God. And that carries us by faith on the breastplate of his righteousness. We have a forerunner who has gone before God. He is for us entered, entered because of us. It was entered even Jesus. Now we come to the right person. The one who is entered. Even Jesus made a high priest forever. After the order of who? Melchizedek. Without beginning, without ending. It's an everlasting order. That God has established. So we come to the end of the study. We read two more verses and we end. Three more verses and we end. In 2 Corinthians, this is Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19, it says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached amongst you by us. I don't know who we preach these days. I hope we preach Jesus. I hope we just don't preach church building. I hope we just don't preach other things. I hope we preach Jesus. Because that's who was preached among us by Severus and Thomas. And Timothy, amen, was even yea, was not yea and nah. It, he wasn't no and yes. When Jesus Christ is preached, he is not no and yes, no. But in him was yea. And then in verse 20, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, it says, for all the promises of God in him are yes. And in him, amen. Glory the unto the glory of God by us. All the promises of God in him, the pomegranate seeds, the seed, the word of God that is offered, that is packed in blood, in him, the blood that is accepted, the blood that speaks better things, that is better than the sacrifice of Abel, the blood that touches the ground. In the sanctuary service, the blood that is sprinkled on the on the altar, the blood that is sprinkled on the on the, on the people themselves, the blood of the covenant, that is the yes blood, that is the accepted blood. So in Genesis, in Genesis forty nine verse ten, it says, "The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between thy feet." Until Shiloh comes. Shiloh is Jesus. Shiloh comes and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Unto him, who is in the most holy place, the gathering of the people shall be. This is the pomegranate study of the seeds packed in blood. Join me next week as we talk about the next verse in the Songs of Songs. Chapter 6, verse 8. We'll talk about verse 8. Thank you for joining me.